Bowden is a 14-time award-winning author of 28 titles connected to Napoleonic and American military history. So he's a, he's a military historian of the French. Uh, I, I think he knows the German. He knows it all. He knows all the military history, but particularly the French and American. He's a fellow in Les Souvenirs, Napoleon International, and he's one of the few historians working in both Napoleonic French and American history. His books have been named part of the curriculum in the École Militaire, in the U.S. Army Command, General Staff College, as well as part of the Chief of Staff Air Force recommended reading list. His current work projects include the groundbreaking breaking multi-volume series, Robert E. Lee at War, which is the mind and method of a great American soldier. And this is, these books are so beautifully executed. They're so gorgeous. One, one of them I know has got gold trim on the edges, gold edges. It's just incredible. And he's also got several titles connected to the Napoleonic Wars, uh, in 2021, he released Lone Star Flag to the Top, Robert E. Lee and the Texas Brigade at Gettysburg. And it includes previously unpublished vignettes of Robert E. Lee and the famous brigade he called My Texans. So he's going to speak this afternoon on the wilderness. And as you know, the wilderness is one of the themes of this seminar because it was the theme of the 1881 reunion here in Durham. Please join me in welcoming Scott Bowden. Today, uh, Martha asked me to talk on uh, Robert E. Lee, the Texas Brigade in the Wilderness. I want to thank the members of the, uh, the Board of Directors for having me back, and uh, all of you who were here last year, and uh, asking that I return. Thank you very much for that. Um, in the spring of 64, Lee wrote a letter to Jeff Davis that said, you know, if we defeat or drive the enemy from the field, we can have peace. And rather than today give a micro history of the wilderness so I thought I'd touch on many things that impacted the Texas Brigade, Robert E. Lee's leadership, and uh, in, end up with the action at the wilderness. Now uh, this all is part of the Robert E. Lee at War multi-volume series, the third volume of which goes to press this year. Um, as Martha was mentioned that when I was uh, before I wrote this thing, I decided that in order to get a frame of reference of Lee's context that he had of making his decisions, so I need to read everything that we know that he had either in his personal library or that he had checked out uh, from the West Point Library. It took a few years to do that, but uh, I thought that I gained a lot of insight by doing that, and I believe the series will reflect that as you read it. Um, in 1861, uh, Benjamin Franklin Reinhardt, who was an artist in Richmond, uh, painted a portrait of Lee as military commander of Virginia's military forces. You'll see this is not exactly the image that most people have when they close their eyes and they hear the name Robert E. Lee. The original of this is over at the R.W. Norton Art Gallery in Shreveport and it's worth seeing if you ever get a chance to do so. Now, very quickly, let's go through Lee's military timeline. He graduated at, uh, from the U.S. Military Academy in 1829. In 1855, he transferred from the staff, which is the engineers, because being near the, at the top of his academic class, he went into the engineers uh, when he became commissioned. And he transferred to the line, that was the cavalry, uh, in 1855, when those four regiments of uh, infantry and cavalry, two infantry, two cavalry, were raised for frontier protection. And so he became a lieutenant colonel in 1855. March 1861, he received his commission as full bird colonel of the 1st U.S. Cavalry from Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Now, he 
resigned his commission, uh, then as full colonel, April 2061. And there's that famous story about him meeting with uh, Preston Blair and, and then going to Winfield Scott before he made his decision to give up his commission. Now, from April 23rd, so back again, he uh, resigns his commission April 20. On April 23, uh, he accepted Virginia's offer to be the commander of her military forces. It was a position that he held only uh, for a few weeks because on June 8 um, was his last day in that capacity because the following day, all Virginia's military forces passed to the authority of the central government. And he was out of a job from then until July 28. Jeff Davis did not use him for anything. Amazing, right? And there's a story there, and uh, we may get into some of that. On July 29, 61, until October 30, he was given the, given the in, unenviable um, job to go to Western Virginia to coordinate those three clowns that were operating Confederate forces in the area, okay? And uh, there are two politicians and one professional military guy, neither, none of them very good. And at the time when he left Richmond, the Richmond Examiner said that his mission was is understood to be one of inspection and consult and consultation on the plan of campaign because he was not given any actual command authority by Jeff Davis for that job. Now, in, once he was in uh, on his way to Western Virginia, he wrote a letter back to his wife, August 4, and he described his assignment as insane. In, insane. He thought, he thought being sent out there to the wilds of Western Virginia without any real command authority to be insane. So by the time he comes back, November 4, uh, he gets reassigned. He comes back the day before Thanksgiving. In less than a week, he's reassigned as the commander of the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and East Florida. Interestingly, in those few days that he was in Richmond, he goes out to visit a good friend of his, John Bill Hood, who was at the time the Colonel of the Fourth Texas. And Hood tells the story that when, when Lee came to visit, he was bragging that he had trained or drilled the Fourth Texas to such a proficient state that they could double time to the gates of hell and not break their stride. Okay? That story is going to come back on Hood very, very quickly. November 4, to, November 4 to March 3rd, Lee is down in South, Carol um, South Carolina, Georgia, and East Florida building river defenses. Anybody that knows anything about engineering knows that somebody other than his uh, grade could have been down there doing the same thing. And when he was assessing how President Davis was utilizing his talents, Lee wrote a, a letter to his youngest daughter, Mildred, on November 15 about his new assignment. And he said it was another forlorn expedition, worse than West Virginia. He had no high expectations or uh, appreciation of how Jeff Davis was using him. Now, when he's recalled to Richmond on March the 2nd, he arrives the next day and he spends 10 days cooling his heels doing nothing because Davis uh, is not very happy about the fact that the Confederate Congress wanted him recalled. Uh, in the meantime, there is um, a bill passed to be a not a commander in chief, or Davis is a commander in chief, but to be, a, be a, in an office of commanding the Confederate armies and coordinating all the military um, activities. Now, Davis vetoes that or he returns it without signing it, and the Confederate Congress cannot overcome that um, uh, in effect of veto. So Davis convinces them that Lee's going to be his advisor, and he maintained that until Mar May 31, uh, when Joe Johnston uh, got wounded. 
Now, the editors of the faraway newspaper Charleston Mercury were not fooled by what Jeff Davis was doing, and they accurately described Lee as being reduced from a commanding general to an orderly sergeant in their March 24 edition. Now, June 162, with Joe Johnston seriously wounded at Seven Pines in their fighting for the railroad station at Fair Oaks, Davis had no choice but to name Lee as commander of the Confederacy's principal army. Finally, Lee had a real command. So he takes command, Jude Wood, and what he finds is a mess. The army that he inherits is nothing more than conjuries of units. Without discipline, without lacking cohesion, they had no esprit de corps. Bob Chilton, who was often called Lee's uh, chief of staff, said that uh, Lee inherited a command that was, quote, an armed mob, a ragtag collection of, quote, magnificent material of undisciplined individuality. That was the emphasis in the original. Now, but Lee had no time to rest on all this. He initially and began what amounted to a 19-hour work day, every day. He spends the next several weeks reconning the federal lines to assess and analyze what they were going to do. He had to inspect the regimental camps to get to know the officers as far down the chain of command as he could. He also had to bring in troops to concentrate them in preparation for the upcoming campaign to save Richmond because uh, McClellan was just a few miles outside the city. And he also had to draw up a plan to repel the federal uh, army. Now, Lee and his staff, uh, shown here, um, he came up with the plan of campaign, very Napoleonic, turning maneuver. Uh, at least initially it was. It became a, a, mother, a much smaller size one. But eventually that campaign became known as the Seven Days. Now, the first um, victory that Robert E. Lee had was at Gaines Mill, 27 June, 62. And to make the story very, very short, uh, by the time late afternoon, um, all the Confederate forces had not yet shown up, but were beginning to arrive with Jackson's wing of the army. And Lee, in his, oh, way that he was used to doing things for Winfield Scott in Mexico, he went to scout the federal lines. It was Robert E. Lee that pinpointed the weak point in the, in the federal defenses along the Boatswain Swamp, that, and he went to Chase Whitey as well as to John Bell Hood to point out to them where they needed to attack. That's when Lee told uh, Hood, you know, you were bragging about how the, you could double time the Fort Texas to the gates of hell and not break their stride. Well, now you're going to get your chance. Incidentally, the um, veterans of Lee's army always considered the federal lines at Gaines Mill to be the most formidable defensive positions they ever saw during the war. Okay, much, much more formidable than what they saw on other fields. And he's talking, Lee's personal recon spots the weak point, and he communicates that to Whiting and Hood. And after Hood dismounts, he leads for Texas, as we know, that breaks the federal lines and uh, initiates the breakthrough. Uh, two days later, uh, the the Texas Brigade is in basically a reserve um, uh, role during the fighting at Fraser's Farm, where Lee tries a double envelopment, that he takes a page out of Hannibal Barca's playbook from the Second Punic War about how to envelop a, a, an enemy force that is much larger than yours. It would have worked, uh, probably, had Jackson not uh, dropped the ball at White Oak Swamp uh, when Longstreet was doing so well down on the Fraser's farm front. But from the Seven Days campaign, once Lee goes to reorganize the army, he understood that he needs more Texans, right? And to Wigfall, he asks if additional regiments could be sent to the Army of Northern Virginia 
so that two full Texas brigades could be fielded. You can see those letters uh, into uh, that correspondence to Davis as well as to Wigfall. Um, but no, more Texans were coming uh, as far as regimental size were concerned. And the next uh, uh, time the Texans were in action was at Second Manassas. This image of uh, Lee Jackson and Longstreet having a conference the afternoon of the 29th after uh, Longstreet's wing with Lee uh, present arrived that morning. And uh, interestingly enough, um, they talked not only about what the Federals were doing, but what they were going to do the next day. And they had a, 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 a command conference the night of the 29th before the, uh, the Battle of the Second Day at Second Manassas. And at that conference, it was, uh, it was uh, the options were laid out. If the Federals attack Jackson again, Jackson's going to hold until they get an opportunity. We can have an opportunity to counter punch with Longstreet's wing, okay, against their flank. Lee laid this all out. If the Federals did not attack, then we're going to take the entire army around the Federal right at the night of the 30th, okay? Now, on the, uh, but on the, uh, the morning, late afternoon, uh, late morning, early afternoon of the, uh, of the 30th, the Federals fired up again against Jackson. Jackson's wing holds. And then, because the Confederates on the um, Longstreet's wing are already deployed, the Texas Brigade had, in the afternoon of the 29th, launched a what is known as a reconnaissance in force, basically, to kind of get out in front of their line. And uh, they had a, a minor action there, but they kept their positions. And at the conference that night, it was discussed that if Longstreet's column was to launch on the 30th, they would go in an attack on echelon from the center. Now, people that know military terms know that you can, if you have an on echelon, echelon means in steps, right? You can, you can echelon from the right, you could echelon from the left, or you could echelon from the center, which is, looks like a giant arrow, okay? And at the time, the Texas Brigade was already positioned to be the tip of that arrow, and that's exactly how they launched it on the afternoon of the 30th, that the Texas Brigade was the tip of the Longstreet's column, the arrow of the counterattack that struck the federal lines. Okay, so the, the, the Texas Brigade is the tip of the Confederate wave. The, the counterattack on August 30, 62 does great damage to John Pope's Army of Virginia. Um, it's arguable that they could have been, oh, completely annihilated on the battlefield had Jackson not disobeyed two direct orders from Lee to get his guys moving after the morning action because it was his inaction, that's Jackson's inaction, when Longstreet is striking the federal left, Jackson's inaction allowed the federals to shift their, re or shift their unengaged people down in front of Longstreet to basically to sacrifice themselves, to buy time long enough for the rest of the army to get away. Had Jackson pressed them from the front, they would not have had the opportunity to do exactly that. So, with the successful, but not anywhere close to being the same type of damage they did, say, at uh, first Manassas, but uh, nevertheless, John Pope's army is defeated and has to seek refuge in the fortifications of Washington City, uh, Lee makes the decision to uh, continue the offensive by taking the army across the Potomac into Maryland, hopefully into uh, Pennsylvania. Next action, the uh, Texas Brigade seizes at Sharpsburg uh, when in the morning of the 17th, um, uh, the Texans, part of Hood's division, temporarily on loan to Jackson's wing and the army are called to shore up Jackson's very quickly crumbling front 
at uh, Sharpsburg, and in the Miller cornfield as the Texas Brigade, along with Evander Laws or McIver, McIver Laws, uh, Alabamans on their right, <laughs> their left flank support in the form of uh, Jubal Early's Virginians are uh, withdrawn. And that's one of the reasons that why the Texas Brigade gets hammered so badly at Farmer Miller's cornfield is because their left flank support was lacking. But nevertheless, after the campaign, Lee again writes that he wants more Texans. I rely upon these we have in all tight places, and I fear I have to call on them too often. With a few more such regiments as Hood has now, as an example of daring and bravery, I could feel much more confident. Okay? And you can see the sources there that he has to Wigfall, as well as there's some others uh, that uh, are readily available at Hill College and elsewhere. The big army reorganization of October 1862 uh, is one of Lee's most um, enduring accomplishments that he did administratively with the army, because he has to make a uh, he has to set right what he in, he inherited back in June. Now, although the army had not emerged victorious from the Maryland campaign, you you have to remember they got lots of captured ordnance, small arms, munitions, wagons, horses, mules, and much more that significantly helped to improve um, the Confederate logistical capabilities. And in addition to that, the accomplishment of Lee's command had achieved during the first summer of his tenure helped change the Army for better. Now, despite all the challenges facing Lee and his inherited command that had dated back to the seven days, um, and despite all the hardships, the Army had uh, developed a new esprit de corps and in Elan. Now these newly developed traits were undeniably due to in large measure to Lee's superior leadership that he had uh, uh, shown over the summer and this example also translated into more importantly uh, what Napoleon called uh, the biggest challenge that men have while under arms that being the first qualification of a soldier being fortitude under fatigue and uh, want of food and other things. Okay. Now, without question, Lee's men had triumphed the seven days Second Manassas, despite the lack of enough officers, proper subsistence, woefully inadequate medical services, inferior equipment, as well as shortages, clothes, and shoes. And by the time the Southern banners were brought back to Virginia uh, after the uh, action at Shepherdstown on the the twentieth of September, sixty-two. The, uh, I say the, the men in gray or rat tattered rags standing beneath the colors didn't even look like an army. Um, yet their success over the past months had created kind of a dual implicit pride and trust in their commanding general, as well as a newfound confidence in their ability to overcome um, their dawning shortages. I, I'm not sure a lot of you have read about the, uh, the condition of the men at, at this period of time. Uh, and within the annals of American history, only the patriots who won independence for the colonies were ever phys physically more challenged to march and fight and endure on less. But uh, Lee had instilled in them that, uh, like their forefathers, they had to have this collective spirit and temperament for an audacity and a determination to conquer or die. And uh, in this reorganization, um, Lee made many changes that were based on his personal observation the previous summer. And he wanted to put his best brigades in select divisions so that when they needed to hit hard, they were not all concentrated into one division, but they had different ones in different places. Okay, all came from his examples uh, of knowing th what their combat value was. We'll get into a little bit of that in a, a little bit later. But a sample of the severe shortages, there's a member of the 3rd Arkansas 
that, remember, and this is, quote, shortly after the awful fatigues and marches of the first Maryland campaign, which is the Sharpsburg campaign, uh, the troops were encamped somewhere between Shepherdstown and Winchester. We were sorely in need of clothes and shoes, and there was not a blanket in the command. Now, that's from a Confederate veteran article in 1912. And it's estimated that almost a quarter of the men in Longstreet's command had no shoes when the Fredericksburg campaign began. And that's after they had the reorganization to get them equipped as much as possible. In calculating the average number of barefoot men in the 14 other, other reporting brigades outside Hood and Ransom's divisions, there were on average more than 417 without shoes in each brigade. That's a pretty tough deal going into the winter months, don't you think? Okay, for the results of Lee's efforts, you can look into the various um, official records and where he is trying to get things done that really an army commander didn't need to be doing, but he had to do it because it was out of necessity. In the October reorganization, he didn't have, Lee didn't have enough regiments to make an all-Texas brigade, as we know. So he takes the Hampton Legion, in the 18th Georgia, and uh, sends them to other formations. He brings in the 3rd Arkansas that he had become oh, familiar with during the uh, Cheat Mountain campaign in 61. And uh, therefore, the brigade becomes all trans-Mississippi. Uh, Jerome Robertson of the 5th being the brigade commander. Now, uh, as we see, Walford, the 18th Georgia, was sent to Cobb's Brigade. Hampton's Legion was sent over to Micah Jenkins' South Carolina Brigade. Uh, October reorganization, he restructures the commands based on his close observations of the summer battles of 62. These are available at the National Archives under the Army Northern Virginia Record Group 109, as you can read. And uh, the army that emerges from those fall camps is truly Lee's army. He leads him into Pennsylvania in the summer of 63, Texas Brigade on the July 2nd in action. Again, this famous picture by Dale Gowan of the 1st Texas uh, taking Smith's battery out, uh, part of Smith's battery out on uh, Hawks Ridge. Uh, the 4th and 5th Texas, in the meanwhile, are ensconced down at Slaughter Pen and the base of Big Round Top uh, to push up against Little Round Top, as you can see there. These images by Gallon are terrific. Now, by the time of January 64, I wanted to pause for a minute and have you all look at this. Here's a man, April 61, and the same man, January 64. And if, <laughs> if you don't think stress of carrying a small uh, republic on your shoulders, the future of a republic on your shoulders, doesn't do things to you, just take a look at that. I, I understand one is in color and one's in black and white, but you can still see the what the toll that took on him, okay? Now, the for the 1864 spring campaign, the Eastern Theater, as you can see here, uh, this is a map from 62, but the I, I put it up there because it shows the complete waterways down on the uh, east side of the map, as well as where Richmond is. Um, and I need to, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come out here and use this uh, laser just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Okay? Um, Richmond, for, for you over here, Richmond's right there. Okay? And over here, Richmond, on this side, <clears throat> is right there, right there. It's where Richmond is, okay? Now look at the waterways, if you will, and ask yourself, if you were going to lead 100,000 men over 300 cannon and 70,000 animals, 80,000 animals, against the Confederacy, what would you rather do? Go overland or take the army by water and land on the south side of the James and disembark them there and go straight at uh, Petersburg? Ask yourself. 
what makes more sense? Okay? It makes more sense to go by water, doesn't it? Okay? Well, instead, we have up the upper part, upper left of the map, we have the Federal Army concentrating around Culpeper, while uh, um, the uh, Confederate Army around Orange in front of Gordonsville is, uh, you know, contesting them on the on way on the western side of the Overland Route. Why was it that Grant was insisted by his superior officers, meaning his civilians, to take the army overland. The, uh, the answer to that is that um, Francis Pierpont, who is the Union War Governor of Virginia and the father of Western Virginia, okay, tells us in his meetings with Lincoln that Lincoln had promised his moneyed sources their war profits and they wanted to make sure that they had sufficient time to do that and to take the army by water would cut the, the time of campaign and the and the war shorter okay and but you have to have your war profits never mind the loss of life okay true story that's why Grant goes overland, but he goes overland not even in a uh, a sophisticated let's faint here and go there. He just it, it's all in on one massive push uh, down across the Rapidan and into the wilderness. And uh, to meet him there at the wilderness. Oh, one other thing here. This this. This map of the railroads of the Confederacy really doesn't show it well, but the reason that you go after uh, land on the south side of the James and go after Petersburg is because you can you you really uh, do a number on the 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 Confederates in the Richmond area if you do that. Well, anyway, by the time the the Overland Campaign begins, the Army of the Potomac has 116,000 uh, present and under arms in 40 infantry brigades, seven brigades of cav, and 358 guns. Now that's according to Grant's own article that appeared in the Battles and Leaders of Volume 3 called Preparing for the Campaigns of 64. Uh, Lee's army, 65,000, almost the same number of brigades, but they're much smaller. Same number of brigades of cavalry, much smaller. At only 224 guns, now that's according to Longstreet's Manassas to Appomattox. Walter Taylor's figures in his book, Four Years with General Lee, even puts the number of, of the, those present under arms for the Army of Northern Virginia even smaller at, at 61. But nevertheless, uh, Grant has a, uh, and there's some, been some recent uh, work on Lee's army that suggests that they were larger than this, but uh, it doesn't matter that even if they were slightly larger, they're significantly outnumbered. But the big, <laughs> most the biggest advantage that Grant had was in his artillery arm, and he negated that by taking them overland through the camp, through the wilderness. And there, to meet him in the wilderness, is uh, the first two corps, or I should say, two corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. That being the second and third under Dick Yule and Powell Hill. Uh, Longstreet is following. A day behind because Lee wanted to be certain that um, the Grant wasn't being clever and fainting uh, a movement into the wilderness and then going to come down the uh, the western approach but so Longstreet follows behind and on May 5th they collide in uh, the wilderness they had a terrific fight uh, the Federals pressing hard against Dick Yule's Second Corps and uh, Powell Hill's Third. Now, by the time of May 6th, which is the second day, uh, Hill's Third Corps is played out. In fact, uh, 
they had been expecting Longstreet's uh, column to show up all during the night, and uh, they were really even making plans to, uh, to do anything the next morning when the Federals struck. And uh, normally, for combat formations such as the Light Division, under now is under Cadmus Wilcox, um, collapsed rel relatively quickly. And uh, as uh, the, the, one of the famous stories of Lee, who was in the Widow Taps um, uh, cabin area, gets a full uh, frontal of um, uh, Maxie Gregg's old brigade, now under um, uh, uh, their famous one of the, one of the former colonels, um, coming at a run to him. And he says, man, is this, is this your men running like a flock of geese? Because he's not, he couldn't believe that they were running the way they did. And to stop the Federals from pursuit, uh, you had, a, you had a, a battalion of artillery from 3rd Corps Unlimber on the western edges of this opening. Now, uh, Lee meets the Texans behind Tom Pogue's artillery battalion. Federal lines are about 1,300 yards away from Pogue's 16 guns that are unlimbered and whose muzzles control the intervening terrain. Now, it's while uh, John Gregg, the new brigade commander of the Texas Brigade, is deploying behind Pogue's guns is when Lee meets up with them. And according to uh, many, Lee says, give those men the cold steel, those men being the Federals. They will stand and fire all day and never move unless you charge them. That is what Robert Campbell remembered Lee telling John Gregg as he uh, rode up on the scene. That article is in Lee in the Wilderness in Harvey Hill's uh, periodical called The Land We Love, October 68 edition. Hurrah for Texas! Hurrah for Texas! Lee to the brigade as he quoted in Susan Pendleton Lee's memoirs of William Nelson Pendleton. Okay, Texans always move them. Lee told the brigade, as quoted by Frank Chilton in the Unveiling and Dedication uh, article. And there are about two dozen contemporaries that recorded the verbal exchanges between Lee and Gregg's men. Now, it was at this time that Lee moves at the head of the Texans through Pogue's guns, saying, hurrah for the Texas Brigade, uh, shouted Lee, and there's a mighty cheer that follows. One member of the 1st Texas recalled, I never heard such a shout as when General Lee mounted on his splendid horse appeared a warrior where every god had set the seal. And as Lee moved to the front of them, this is still uh, behind the artillery line, uh, Tom Pogue recalled that Lee was perfectly composed, his face reflecting grim determination. Not only that, Pogue, uh, being an artillerist and also having uh, lots of interaction with animals, recalled that General Lee's horse, Traveler, also sensed uh, the, the intensity of the scene, as indicated by his raised head with ears pointing to the front. Very interesting. Now, according to the Texans, Lee wanted to lead the charge. And many eyewitnesses recorded that they saw tears streaming down Lee's face. The fire of battle was in Lee's eyes, and he quivered with emotions. That's Winkler. I will lead you men, as quoted by Captain A.C. Jones of the 3rd Arkansas. I want to lead the Texas Brigade in this charge, Lee is quoted again by Wheeler of the 4th Texas. Okay, once he passed the gun line, okay, after the guns had fired a few rounds into the Federals to keep them at bay, Lee at this time was following immediately behind the battle line. And according to Colonel Venable of Lee's staff, the men did not perceive at that moment that he was going with them until they advanced some distance in the charge beyond Pogue's guns. Uh, Porter Alexander, who was not there, 
but he's pretty reliable in as far as telling people uh, what happened, said that the old man with a light of battle in his eyes rode up behind their line following them in the charge. Now, <clears throat> go back, go back, lead to the rear. Um, Rick Featherston's ancestor, Malachi Reeves, Company I, First Texas, said this, at this critical moment, General Lee rode into the same opening between the lines, our first Texas on his left and the fourth Texas on his right. The heat of battle was growing and our men were falling all about us. Four of our men sprang for the bridle, reined his horse to a stop. At the same moment, four of the fourth Texas reached out for the same purpose. From the ranks, we yelled, Go back, Lee, to the rear. Now, at least 38 eyewitnesses described the shouts with which the Texas Brigade members turned Lee back from being part of the charge. Okay? Uh, turning Lee and Traveler around to enlisted men are among the best candidates for grasping Traveler's reins and turning them around one from the 4th and one from the 5th Texas are the two leading candidates. Now, contemporary sources uh, list who those men are, and uh, you can read those and make, it, make a decision yourself. But basically, this map or this um, shows the path of the 4th Texas going from Tom Pogue's gun line to strike uh, the Federals that were on the eastern edge of the clearing. Now it was important because the Federals were steamrolling in this direction from, from your right to the left, and uh, they had to stop their advance and uh, drive them back. Now, the Texas Brigade directly attacked into two Federal Brigades numbering more than 6,100 combatants. Texas Brigade had 800, right? Now they're outnumbered seven to one. Now, not all of the feds were on the front lines, but the numbers are significant because they had immediate tactical reserves. This map is hard to see, but you have uh, the four regiments of the Texas Brigade going into the uh, two brigades of federals. 800 charging uh, over 6,000. Eyewitness assessments, I need not say that the Texans went forward in their charge and did well their duty. They were 800 strong and lost half their number killed and wounded on that bloody day. The battle was soon restored and the enemy driven to the position of the night before. That's, that's Colonel Venable of his staff that saw the action. It's quoted in Lindsey Long's memoirs of Robert E. Lee. Now the Texas Brigade casualties are broken down in uh, Mike Priest's book um, as follows. You see present, he gives them 790 that were present. The total casualties is 440. Interestingly enough, federal casualties on May 6th among the units engaged against the Texas Brigade. Analysis of the unit casualties estimate federal casualties of the units that, that were against the Texas Brigade while they were facing them in this 15 to 20 minutes, they suffered a, they suffered casualties in excess of 1,130. Now, therefore, while the Texas Brigade casualties were very severe by attacking far superior numbers of Federals, the Texas Brigade inflicted significantly more damage than they suffered. Now, you might think that, that was strange. Well, not necessarily. The trend of first displayed on, long, on large scale at Gaines Mill, repeated at Second Manassas, Gettysburg, and even Chickamauga, was displayed again at the wilderness. That being that truly elite Confederate formations, such as the Texas Brigade, would, not could, would inflict more damage while on the offensive than the opposition would inflict in return while standing on the defensive. 
How many of you have been in chat rooms or discussed the, these ideas of the power of the defensive was stronger than the offensive? Well, it depends on how good your units are, right? It depends on how, how your di unit discipline is, how your fire discipline is. It's like at Second Manassas when the Texas Brigade came up against Governor K. Warren's Brigade of Yankee Zoavs, you know, the, what, the 5th and the 10th New York, and they let, low, they let fly their initial volleys. They all went over their, the heads of the Texas Brigade, and the Texas Brigade keeps, you know, firing and advancing, and finally, when they're within about 10 uh, feet of them or 10 steps of them, they let loose a volley that uh, cut down, you know, what, 80%? Of that uh, of, of the leading regiment of Governor K. Warren's uh, brigade. So we see that truly elite Confederate formations such as the Texas Brigade would inflict more damage. Okay? Now, truly elite Confederate formations, including the Texas Brigade and the 1st Mississippi Brigade, which was Featherston, Barksdale, and Humphreys, okay? they would inflict more damage while on the offensive than the opposition would inflict in returning or standing on the defensive. This because that as, as bizarre as this sounds, with muzzle-loading weapons, they could fire their weapons and reload while on the move, while the, the unit is on the move, okay? And then fire again with more lethality than the defending formations could deliver as they were, as they were uh, coming into them. It goes against almost everything that people are told about the war. Now, as it's true if you have Confederates behind prepared positions with rested weapons like they were at Cold Harbor, no, nothing's gonna move them off of that. Uh, but you have to realize that really good Confederate units attacking were very lethal, as well as uh, uh, the Texas Brigade, as well as the Mississippians and others. And we see that there in the, the uh, casualty returns from these uh, different battles. So, the Texas Brigade examples, Gaines Mill, Segment Assis, Sharpsburg, Gettysburg, Chickamauga Wilderness. Um, what we take from that is that the Texas Brigade was arguably one of the, the very best combat formations ever wear an American uniform, okay? And their combat performance and record uh, confirms that. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of our presentation with the Texas Brigade at the Wilderness.